Have you ever found yourself relaxing in the tub thinking, hmm, how could I design my own CPU? Okay, maybe that's not quite as likely, but let's say you work for a large company that is legitimately looking to do something like that. Where do you even start? I mean, I guess, could you license intellectual property from Intel or ARM? I mean, maybe, but that kind of thing is gonna cost you an arm and a leg. So then what other options are out there? Well, when we asked just that question to Krista Asanovich, co-creator of Risk Five, he was quick to bring over actually like a team of people and one of these computers based on Risk Five's free and open architecture, which surprisingly functions like a normal PC. And I cannot wait to tell you guys about this thing. So there's a good chance that right now you're thinking, okay, cool tech demo, Quake 2, but I'm not gonna have one of these open processors in my computer anytime soon, so why should I care? Well, you should care because you actually can expect to find RISC-V processors in your gaming rig much sooner than you'd think, just for the time being, not as your primary central processing unit. So NVIDIA and Western Digital, along with around a hundred other companies, will soon be shipping products with RISC-V microprocessors on board due to it having better efficiency, better security, and that sweet, sweet royalty-free license to boot. In order to appreciate how cool RISC-V actually is though, we do need a bit of a history lesson. So back in the 1960s, RAM was made using tiny magnetic cores, and th these were super duper slow compared to the vacuum tube processors of the time. So to make sure that the processor wasn't just wasting cycles while the RAM was catching up, every instruction from the memory ran a little program hardwired inside the processor called microcode. With the 70s came the space race, where scientists figured out how to put a lot of transistors on one chip, which meant that now fast memory could be put on the same chip as the CPU. So then microcode just got thrown in the garbage bin of history, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. A lot of that same microcode from way back then actually still exists in modern computers for software backwards compatibility. The legendary Intel 8086 CPU pioneered a new computer architecture, x86. But you could make the argument that it was just hastily thrown together by Intel engineers in just a few weeks. And they, they had no way of knowing that it was gonna become the de facto home computer architecture for decades to come, thanks to its use in the original IBM PC. But with an average of one instruction being added every couple of weeks since its inception, x86 has gone from poorly thought out to today ballooning to over 1,500 instructions. I mean, think of it like the English language. How many words do you use on a daily basis versus how many are in the dictionary? In a modern world, this kind of bloat leads to inefficiency not to mention needless difficulty for anyone that wants to make a processor. So why is everyone still on x86? Well, software support is a big part since porting Windows and all of its programs to a new architecture has proven, we could use a word like inconvenient. I mean, look at Windows RT on ARM, total flop. On top of that, creating a good architecture in the first place is freaking hard. To be clear, those guys that threw it together were pretty talented. They were a pretty talented team. And it's been a lot easier over the last several decades to just make the transistor smaller and pack in more of them. At least it was easier until Moore's law kind of petered out and huge leaps forward in CPU speeds basically stopped in the last five or so years. So clearly a more usable alternative to x86 or ARM was needed. One that was created with modern processors in mind and using the power of hindsight. 
that other architectures didn't get to benefit from, which is where Krista and his team come in, creating the Reduced Instruction Set Computing 5, or RISC 5, the core of which has less than 50 instructions instead of 1,500-ish. There will probably be more by the time this video is out. Now, those 50 instructions are locked down and won't be changing in the future. So ideally, a program made 60 years from now using RISC-V should work just fine on processors being made today. I mean, slowly though. But what if those 50 instructions aren't enough? Well, RISC-V is customizable, meaning that if, say, NVIDIA wants to create a processor that is specialized for AI and graphics, they could actually add extra instructions for their task, allowing for greater hardware specialization and much greater efficiency. But of course, there have been open source instruction sets before, and they have never taken off. So back to that question. Why do we care about this one? Well, the members list for the RISC-V Foundation is kind of a who's who of the biggest tech companies, including, but not limited to, Google, Samsung, Nvidia, Tesla, IBM, and a hundred or so more, including a startup founded by the creators of RISC-V, Sci-5, to help kickstart RISC-V adoption and to avoid that chicken and egg problem with hardware and software by creating the world's first commercial RISC-V silicon. So this right here is the FU540, which stands for Freedom Unleashed 540. Definitely not what else FU could mean uh, towards lockdown standards. So, so this $1,000 processor is, well, not particularly fast with four cores that uh, on this particular board can clock up to 1.6 gigahertz on a 28 nanometer process node. But breaking speed records is not exactly the point. When this processor was announced with support for Linux back in February, you could run pretty much nothing on it. But here we are just six months later, and 80% of the Debian software library has been compiled for RISC-V, meaning that all you need to install almost any app is a quick apt-get command. But of course, the point of this board isn't for you to run games on it, even if it does run Quake 2, thanks to this configuration. So we've got the processor here, which sits under this tiny little heatsink and fan. Then we've got the RAM, so that's eight gigs of DDR4 with ECC. We've got gigabit ethernet right here. We've got USB and uh, let's see, yeah, we've got a micro SD card reader right here. But what makes it unique is this chip connector right here. This allows for you to connect the CPU to, well, anything you'd like. So currently, on the table in front of me here, we've got another unit that's connected to an FPGA that handles PCI Express lanes for what you could kind of consider a, a larger scale motherboard here. So now we've got a graphics card. This is just a regular HD 6450 AMD graphics card. We've got a Samsung M.2 drive on the other side, plus we've got a bunch more IO. But you know what else you could connect here? pretty much anything. This allows companies to build whatever custom solution they would like onto the Sci-5 processor board. So the TLDR is that it can interface with whatever FPGA or custom silicon is needed while getting the advantages of the RISC-V instruction set, Linux support, and also all of the intellectual property and legal work that Sci-5 has already put in to make sure that things like the RAM work with the CPU. So in the future, Sci-5 is looking to have sort of a Domino's pizza approach to custom chips, where a company can come in and add on bits for say image processing or autonomous car AI. But now you're probably wondering, why have it open source then? If Sci-5 is sinking all this time into making these custom chips work and into the RISC-V instruction set, why not lock it down so they can keep all the money? Well, say that a company has a driver issue. 
Normally, they would have to go to Intel or whoever to get it fixed, causing a lot of work on both sides and potentially making the company have to disclose what exactly they're working on. Whereas when the software and the hardware is open source, the company can just fix the bug and then upload a fix for the community afterwards. The open source nature is also appealing to companies because if they invest in developing for Risk v and Sci-5 goes under, then all of those man hours don't get wasted. What's going to cause the real stiction of Risk v though is in education. Because it's royalty free, the most popular computer architecture textbooks being published right now and courses being taught in undergrad and graduate programs around the world use Risk v to show students how computer hardware works on a very low level. Previously, some fantasy architecture would have to be used. And then when a computer engineer would enter the field, they'd finally get to work with a messy proprietary ISA. So since very few students will switch up what architecture they use once entering the field, the idea here is that you can expect a lot more custom hardware being made using RISC-V in the future, in your hard drives, in your graphics cards, in your cars. And maybe, maybe someday, even as the primary architecture of your home computer. And you'd be running games more complex than Quake 2 by that time. So thanks for watching guys. If this video sucked, um, hi AMD and Intel and ARM, I guess. Hi guys. Uh, but if you liked it, get subscribed, hit the like button, or check out the link to where we where to buy the stuff we featured. Yeah, I guess we'll have a link. I guess you could buy one if you really want to in the video description. Also linked in the description is our merch store, which has cool shirts like this one and our community forum, which you should totally join.